how I just kind of was grateful to have this second chance, but then also felt like I didn't deserve it. How do you deal with the guilt? When you're sorry for, for something you've done wrong, um, you want to communicate that. I'm Daniel Higgs. I had always experienced bullying ever since second grade in alternative school, and that was the first time I actually felt like I fit in. Um, that was the first time I made friends, and then obviously that group of friends was uh, troubled youth themselves, um, you know, stealing, using drugs, and stuff like that. So that's kind of when my criminal mindset started, I guess you would say. Life happens, and, and certain people know how to deal with things, and certain people don't. Um, I didn't. Needless to say, I still kind of um, chose the wrong people, the wrong places, the wrong things. Um, by the time I was 18 years old, I was using marijuana every day, was using meth every day. Um, I had just turned 18, got multiple felonies in three different counties um, for auto theft. It was difficult to get people to understand then why I was using marijuana and meth. Um, I've always dealt with severe anxiety um, and depression, distraction and the inability to focus. And so, you know, the marijuana helped calm my anxiety and, and ease the depression because I was happy. And then the meth kind of helped me stay focused and motivated. When you're working fast food jobs and not having any insurance or the insurance that you do have doesn't want to cover the, the prescription medications that you need, you kind of just uh, do what you can to get by. That blew my mind because to me, it, it, that was something only war veterans, you know, deal with. The neurologist kind of explained that it was just going to be, you know, a lifelong process. It's, it's not when you're awake, uh, it can happen then, and it's not when you're in a deep sleep. It's really that lucid uh, in between sleep um, when your mind just kind of wanders on its own. You may go a year without an episode, uh, maybe five years, but uh, the risk is always there, the potential is always there. And so that was scary. The only way I knew how to describe it at the time was that I was waking up from these nightmares, still in the nightmare, and I felt like I was being possessed. I felt like something was inside of me controlling me. You know, for your fingers and your hands and your arms to be moving, but you're not moving them. And I had just kind of given up on life then at that point. And then I struggled with being 31 years old and like being told uh, you can't work. The disability process is very painful and strenuous. Um, you know, they tell you you can't have any income at all whatsoever, which was difficult for me to wrap my mind around. You're like, what are you supposed to do? I had just given up. I had friends that I still knew that were drug dealers. I didn't want to be a drug dealer, but uh, I needed a way to make some money. And so they would give me some. I would sell to a couple close friends and make enough to pay back what I owed. And I would have food for the week um, or gas to get where I needed to go. Uh, but very quickly, you know, you start using again um, and it just kind of spiraled out of control. I fell off the bandwagon. Well, I, I fell off the bandwagon like quick and hard. And in a month's time, uh, managed to uh, be so desperate and, and mentally, I felt like I was out of choices. I was out of options. What do you do? And I just didn't want to live anymore. Um, I was too much of a coward to take my own life. And I just wanted it to end. And so throughout life, you know, I believe these seeds get planted and these things that um, sometimes, you know, come back to fruition uh, for our good and for our harm. And so here I was um, on drugs, desperate for money. What do you do? How can you get money? 
A seed had been planted when I was a manager for Noble Romans. I'd been in the food service industry for uh, most of my work life. Um, you know, robbery is something that could happen. You're always prepared for that. Uh, when I was a manager at Noble Romans, uh, we were robbed by our delivery driver. All four of us knew it was him, but because he wore a ski mask, and we knew it was him because his mannerisms and his voice, he had a very unique voice. Um, every single one of us, you know, spoke individually to the detectives and all of us identified him, but because he wore a ski mask and we couldn't ID him by face, um, he got away with it. And, you know, all of us had, you know, that giant gun to our foreheads, to the back of our heads. We all thought we were going to die that night. And I think all of us kind of had some resentment knowing that, you know, this person uh, did what they did to us. Well, I can go rob a place and as long as I have a mask on, they can, they can know it's me. But because they can't ID me by face, I'll get away with it. So that's exactly what I did. I got $130 and I remember um, speeding away from that scene, like screaming at God, like you have to do something. Like, this is not who I am. This is not what I want to do. I felt like a piece of, not just because of, you know, who I was, but um, I'd worked at Speedway before. I know if you have more than $100 in your drawer at any time, it's automatic termination. So you didn't just do something that no one should ever do. Like you cost someone their job um, and not being able to work and not being able to have a job, you know, I knew everything that came with that. And so here you just inflicted this on someone else. And so it's like the saying, you know, hurt people, hurt people. I knew uh, the Noble Romans I used to work at. I knew the office didn't lock. I knew the safe didn't lock. Uh, I knew that there was, you know, $300 in change and $300 in cash in the safe. Um, I knew if it was a Saturday night, that was their busiest night, so you could probably get $1,000 and that should hold you over. And so um, that was my last robbery and um, the delivery driver decided he wanted to be a hero and I'm so glad that he did. Um, he got me in a chokehold or I lost consciousness and when I woke up, I was... Uh, Grateful to be alive, even though I wished I was dead, and surrounded by uh, about 40 IMPD. You keep allowing your situation, your circumstances, your past, um, people, places, things like to control you, to possess you. Um, you know, to predict your future and you don't have to do that anymore. So it was like the first time I just didn't care about that aspect of life. Um, I owe it to myself to be an upstanding member of my community, even if my community or the people around me uh, don't view me as that, don't want me to be that, like I deserve that. And I had this moment where I was like, all the things in your life that you've done wrong, you were capable of doing those things. I kind of had this moment where I connected all the people in my life that said, you're so smart, you're so brilliant, you're so bright, Daniel, you can do anything you want to do. And so here I was, I didn't make a promise to God, I didn't make a promise to my family, I made a promise to Daniel um, that I'm going to change and have the life that I want, even if it was life in prison. And so from there, I just kind of got involved in every program I could, whether I thought it would benefit me or not. There are volunteers that come in who were victims and they get to share um, their trauma and you know, what was done to them with those of us that are perpetrators because it goes back to we are all hurt people that hurt people and that's every single person 
that's incarcerated and every single person that's not. Um, but when you learn who you're hurting, which is not just your victim, but yourself, you're just, you learn that you're inflicting more harm and you just have this moment where you don't want to do that anymore. Um, but then you learn that healed people heal people. And just two months after coming home, I established one of a find. It is antiques, collectibles, rarities, and home decor. Rare, like one of a kind things, unique things. I always enjoyed going to Goodwill, thrift stores, and stuff like that, uh, finding stuff for cheap and reselling it. Um, I was able to do that through the Southport Antique Mall, uh, which is a place I worked when I was 18 years old. Um, so I kind of knew about secondhand retail, you know, I knew about antiques, collectibles, and stuff like that. And then I also knew the stuff that I like, people like. I have to be a part of that solution. That's why uh, building Indy Crime Intervention Task Force was important to me. Um, there are organizations that exist to provide resources, but the people that need those resources don't know about them. Indy Crime Intervention Task Force, Inc., which is a, a state-recognized domestic nonprofit, is a volunteer uh, community-based organization of uh, people that have been homeless, addicts, criminals, perpetrators, and or victims of abuse and violence, uh, people that have experienced food, clothing, and hygiene insecurity, um, people that are familiar with the struggles uh, that have kind of overcome those challenges uh, to be able to provide mentoring and advocacy for individuals that are currently experiencing those issues uh, to kind of help them navigate Obviously, if, if you have someone who is an addict and they are homeless and they are in an abusive relationship, um, just those three aspects, you can probably think of at least two dozen resources they're go going to need. If they don't have a phone, if they don't have a car, um, that's a lot. That's a lot of phone calls to make, a lot of emails to make, a lot of places to go, and we help with that. When you've made the decision that you're never going back to that life, no matter what, if you thought your struggles and your difficulties and your challenges were bad before, uh, prepare for them to get worse um, because they are. Um, just because you've made the commitment, you're not going back to that life. I think people have a problem with people that have been incarcerated, people that used to be criminals um, that have actually turned their life around and want to do good in their community. I've had people in my own neighborhood tell me, you know, just because you have a booth at the Southport Antique Mall does not make you an entrepreneur or a business owner. Um, and as upsetting as that was to hear, part of how I know I've grown, one of the many ways, is that would have defeated me back then. One person pointing you, you out um, I would have wanted to run and hide under my bed. Um, but the new me knows what I know, and so I had to tell this lady, actually, you know, I don't just have a booth at Southport Antique Mall, I have two. And I'm at Midland, and I sell on eBay, and I sell on Poshmark, and I do festivals and events, and guess what? You know, I'm a graduate of the Reentry Entrepreneurial Development Initiative, which means I am an entrepreneur. Oh, and guess what? My business is registered with the state. So I am a business owner. <laughs>